Hello everybody, my name is Divya Ramesh and today I'll be talking about studying terrestrial fish locomotion on wet deformable substrates. Studying how fishes move on to land can help inform the understanding of amphibious locomotion both in the present and the past. Early fishes transitioning from swimming in water to moving on to land ultimately led to all the terrestrial vertebrates present today. Many of the extant fishes also still make forays onto land. Many studies have investigated how the extant fishes move on solid surfaces and often compared them with their aquatic locomotion. These studies revealed how these fishes use morphologies and control systems originally made for swimming for terrestrial movement. But the water to land interface often has wet deformable substrates such as mud and wet sand. Moving on wet deformable substrates can be a challenge since it can either behave like a solid or flow like a fluid depending on the forces applied relative to that of the eel strand. This eel strand at which the solid fluid transition occurs varies a lot as the wet substrate gets drier or wetter. The wet deformable substrate also has strong cohesion and can cause it to stick to the appendages and the body. Studies have begun to explain how the fishes move on wet deformable substrates by mainly quantifying the kinematics and the muscle control. Without quantifying the environmental interaction with the wet deformable substrates, we cannot fully understand how the locomotor morphology, kinematics, and control help permit performance. Natural deformable substrates can have particles of different sizes. Pebbles and boulders are comparable in size to that of the small fishes, so they behave less like deformable terrain and more like uneven or mostly rigid like terrain. Here we only consider deformable substrates with mostly particles that are much smaller in size compared to that of the animals. Among these, substrates that have mostly coarse grain behave differently compared to those with mostly fine clay particles. For example, sand with mostly coarse grains has no grain to grain cohesion and has weaker cohesion when water is added whereas mud with mostly fine clay has stronger cohesion due to the colloidal effect. For both of these substrates, the strength at which the solid to fluid transition occurs also varies with how wet or dry the substrate can become. For example, when there is too much water added, then the mud behaves like a viscous fluid. When there is too little water added, then the mud fractures and behaves like a broken solid. Only the intermediate concentration, uh, solid concentration does the mud go through solid fluid transitions. Although many previous locomotion studies have focused on dry, wet, and saturated sand, fewer have focused on mud in this regime with the solid fluid transition, and they have not studied the interaction mechanics. Here, we will focus on this regime and study how the fishes cope with mud of various strengths common in nature. To do so, it is important to control the mud strength because it affects how much the animal sinks in and how easy it is for the mud to stick to it. Doing this is difficult for natural mud because it is mostly made up of fine clay, but still has some coarse grains, and hence its strength is a function of not only the solid volume fraction, but also percentage of the fine clay amongst the solid particles. Here, we choose clay mud with no coarse grain since it behaves quantitatively similar to that of the natural mud, but its strength is only a function of the vol solid volume fraction. In this talk, I will first talk about the uh, development of the different methods that are used to control and vary the mud strength. Here, we study three distinct sustained terrestrial locomotion strategies for which uh, we choose model organisms. For the appendicular locomotion, we choose the mudskipper. For axial locomotion, uh, we choose axial appendicular locomotion, we choose the fish here. And for the axial locomotion, we choose the rope fish. In this talk, I'll focus more on the mudskipper results. Later in this session, there's another talk where we'll focus more on the development of robot physical models and template models and how they can be used in studying sustained terrestrial loco fish locomotion. As a first step, we first designed an automated system to help prepare mud uniformly for different volume fractions. To help control the water loss of the mud during storage, we used and tested a sealing method where we placed a plastic wrap on top of the mud, which would prevent water evaporation when the lid is open. 
We then added an airtight lid with strap to secure the lid onto the container. Here, we characterized mud on four different locations over the course of one hour, which is the normal duration of our experiments. The results showed that there is similar water loss across all the four locations, and there was some water loss over the course of one hour, but it is well within the deviation. We then built an automated penetration device to help characterize mud by getting the force with respect to depth across different volume fractions. Here, the slope increases as the volume fraction increases. As the intruder goes in, the lift force increases with depth due to the hydrostatic leg pressure. And as the intruder is taken off of the mud, the mud sticks to the bottom, causing a large downward suction force in the opposite direction. This particular characterization of mud also helped us decide which volume fraction we could use for our experiments. During our experiments, the fish disturbs the mud, and hence we need to manually mix and flatten the mud at the start of each trial. So you need to characterize its strength in order for us to keep track of the wall of the uh, strength during our experiments. This cannot be done with the bulky automated penetration device, and the commercial penetrometers are not sensitive enough especially for the weaker mud. Hence, we built a portable version of the automated penetration device, which would allow us to characterize mud during our experiments. We placed cameras under, around the entire uh, mud test bed, which would allow us to track the animals during the animal study. We then developed an experiment protocol where we first stood and flattened the mud. We then performed our animal study, then used the penetrometer to characterize mud strength, and then we repeated the process. We used five animals in total for our animal experiments with a total of 140 trials with one to 11 cycles each. We conducted animal experiments across four different volume fractions, which varied from weak to strong mud. In most of these trials, the mud skipper uses the normal crutching gait. We found that the crutch walk mode speed decreases with the volume fraction, which can be seen here with the, uh, by the slope that decreases with the volume fraction. The animal doesn't use high frequency at the lowest volume fraction. The speed was also found to decrease over each cycle. The animal progresses forward. The forward distance per cycle also reduces as the mud gets weaker, and it also goes down with the increasing cycles. The videos also show that the animals sink in more and struggle more as the mud gets weaker. The reason why this happens is because in order to move forward, the lift force needs to balance the weight. On a stronger mud, um, on a stronger mud, the fish sinks less, and for a more weaker mud, in order to get the uh, in order to get the same force, uh, if the fin motions are not adjusted which then in turn causes more of the mud to stick to the belly. And this prevents it from raising and hence reduces the speed of the animal. The animal uh, also displayed new variants of the crutch mode in order for it to help move on weaker mud. One, uh, the first strategy or the first variant of the crutch mode was where the animal would have a small tail bending to help move forward, but this is still ineffective because it can only do so for one cycle. The second variant is where the animal used a large tail bending to help it move forward. This is similar to the jumping, but in this case, it doesn't leave the surface. We also found that the mudskipper displayed behavior adaptations, which is the jump to overcome challenges on weaker mud. This happens occasionally on stronger mud, which is the 39.2% and the 42% but much more frequently on the 33.8%. However, on the weakest mud, it happened less likely due to the fact that the mud others to the animal that it is difficult for it to jump. We also made a transition diagram for the 27.4% mud, which showed that the animal jumps less often and uses a crutch with large chain tail bending more often. To summarize, we have developed different methods to control and vary the mud strength to help enable repeatable and systematic experiments. We also found during our animal study that the mudskipper's crushing distance per cycle reduces as the mud gets weaker. 
Mudskipper uses behavioral adaptations to accommodate for the weaker mud. Methods developed here will be useful for studying the amphibious locomotion more broadly. For our future work, we will measure detailed kinematics and develop resistive force theory to calculate the forces on the fish body and fins and predict the performance landscapes. We are also happy to collaborate. Please see um, another talk later in the session where we will give more detail about the template level robophysical model to study sustained terrestrial locomotion of amphibious fishes. With this, I would like to thank all of my lab members for their support, the funding sources, and the collaborators for discussions. Thank you.